Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we debrief on the uh, market movements of the day, do as best as we can in a short period of time together, connect the short-term fluctuations, the flickering ticks of a trading day, connect it to the long-term trend. As we've reiterated many times in the show, I think your goal as an investor are three things, uh, you know, three things you're trying to accomplish, especially as an, as an active investor. Uh, number one, identify the trends. Number two, follow those trends. And number two, anticipate when those trends are exhausted. And I think if you answer those questions, one, two, three in order, you know, where is the trend? It's going higher for sure in terms of long-term trend in, uh, in US equities. Um, following the trends. Clearly, we're seeing a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. We want to continue to follow that until proven otherwise. The third question, anticipate when it's over. That, that's when I think we're running into some uh, potential contrarian bearish signals, things like sentiment at extremes, uh, things like breadth at uh, severe uptrends. Uh, you know, a lot of signals that are very similar to previous, even short-term market tops, they're, they're signals of trend exhaustion. That That's not necessarily as much of a timing tool. And that's why I think you need to uh, you know, to pay attention to the charts, follow the charts uh, as they evolve. Uh, as a uh, reminder, we have some wonderful guests on the uh, on the show, uh, and uh, so many that have uh, that have really been uh, great conversations this week. Really enjoyed talking with Mark Young uh, uh, from Wall Street Sentiment uh, yesterday, and uh, picking his brain a little bit on the uh, on the sentiment readings, those signs of euphoria that we've uh, that we've talked about. I uh, also want to uh, mention next week on the 15th, we have Jay Soloff uh, joining uh, the show for the first time. Jay's a, uh, an options expert, really tried to embrace more of the options uh, markets and, uh, and, and build more understanding that some of the feedback we've gotten from you. So, uh, so we have people like Jay coming through to share some expertise. We have Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity coming back on Wednesday, fantastic strategist. And then starting on December 21st, which is not too far away, we start Reflections 2020 which is our uh, year-end programming. We have three sets of, uh, of, of special events for you. Number one, 10 strategists, 10 charts. Uh, each day we'll have a new strategist giving you sort of their top technical theme of the year. That's gonna be a lot of fun. We have a second set of specials focusing on the year-end review process. How do you look at your performance and set yourself up for success in 2021? Uh, I'll be uh, part of that along with some other uh, fantastic experts like Gaddis Rose. Uh, and then our third uh, section is all on sector rotation. You know, this if you look at this year, it's been besides all the other macro headwinds and tailwinds, it's really been a story of leadership transition, especially in the second half of the year. It's what navigated uh, well, what sectors did well going into the bottom of some of the more defensive stuff, what worked coming out of the lows, what worked going into that September peak when we started to see industrials and materials emerge, what kind of worked after that as you saw the FANG trade unwind. So a lot of really interesting themes and Julius DeKempner is going to uh, do a great job for us uh, making that, uh, making that uh, uh, available to you. Let's continue on to wrap the week. I did want to start with a poll. And one of the polls we asked, asked you recently was focusing on sector rotation, uh, leading into uh, the, uh, the theme of the day here. What sector performs best between now and year end 2020? I gave you four choices, energy, financials, technology, consumer discretionary. Uh, votes are in and basically it was, it was kind of split between energy and technology. Technology sort of edged it out uh, by a couple percent, but those two were by far the, uh, the strongest responses. We also had about 15% or so for financials, just under 20% voting consumer discretionary. So overall, uh, technology and energy sort of one and two, which is interesting. Those are two actually very different spaces with very different return profiles and interesting to see that we're sort of split between those uh, two. Of course, those could certainly be the, uh, uh, the two that, uh, that perform very, very well. And again, it's all about what ends up being that sort of uh, you know, sort of uh, safe haven offensive type of thing that's going to help propel us into the uh, into the end of the year. I did not vote in this survey. Boy, if you asked me, I would probably say technology. And I'm just thinking of the the defensive nature of um, uh, of uh, semiconductors. I mean, if I had to pick a group, it would probably be semiconductors in terms of things that it's probably going to hold up well. It's done okay. And then there, some of the names have pulled back a bit. That's not a bad place. I did not give you the option of communication services, but that would probably be my top vote. Uh, if given the choice. Uh, there you go. Great. Uh, thanks, as always, for answering those questions. We have that running at all time on stockcharts.com slash TV. Let's continue on with our wrap the week segment. We're going to go into uh, the uh, the weekly chart here. 
Here we go. This is looking at the last five trading days. We're starting the clock uh, on Friday's close. I don't have the labels on here, so sorry for that. I'll sort of talk through the returns here uh, as we update it for the closing uh, prices. The S&P 500 is here in black, down 1% for the week. And if you look, it was sort of a choppy downward motion for, uh, for much of the week. Most of that uh, came on Thursday, the, uh, the distribution pattern that you saw off of, uh, off of Wednesday. Uh, so overall there, what underperformed the S&P? Only two things, the NASDAQ 100 down 1.2%, and down here at the bottom, Bitcoin down 3.4%. Now, last week, as I told you, Bitcoin is usually at the very top or the very bottom. And last week, if I remember right, it was up here in the double digits and everything else was down middle of the road. So Bitcoin certainly just come off a, a fairly uh, accelerated level coming off that high just below 20,000. Now pulling back of it, and I think for a lot of, uh, crypto bulls. The question is: Are we reloading? Are we reloading? Uh, you know the the, the powder to uh, to propel above twenty thousand and uh, and and uh, and never look back. We'll have to see what happens next week and beyond. What outperformed the S and P emerging markets? Only down about a quarter of a percent. Here was gold up 0.1 percent. Uh, the dollar up 0.3 percent. Gold and the dollar certainly have more been in downtrends and have been giving back a lot of their uh, previous gains. The dollar certainly a weaker and it's propelling U.S. underperformance versus global stocks, as we uh, we hopefully will get to uh, in a little bit. Uh, in terms of things that really outperformed a little more meaningfully, small caps up 1.1 percent. In brown, we have crude oil up 1.2 percent, and in red at the very top, bonds up 2.3 percent. We've talked about the bearish scenario for bonds, which is sort of the base case that I'm looking at. You certainly didn't see that uh, this week, where the stock to bond ratio, and you know, according to the week, certainly favoring bonds over stocks, although the long-term trajectory certainly has been favoring the S&P over the TLT, if you look at the two of those. Let's just review very quickly what else happened today, and then we'll get into the uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list, which is where I'd like to spend as much time as possible. The Dow was actually up uh, a token amount today, the S&P down a little bit. It was really a V-shaped uh, uh, move with the sell-off into lunchtime, and then a rally going into the close. Small caps down 0.8%, so that was probably the big uh, loser out of the major indexes, the VIX back up uh, around 23.40 or so. Bonds, uh, you know, finishing the day uh, a little more positive than negative, up 0.4%. Ten-year yields back below 90 basis points. Gold and silver essentially mixed. Gold rallied pretty good out of the open, but settled back down. So over, uh, overall, sort of a mixed bag there in the commodity space. Oil down uh, a bit, and that's why energy was the worst of the 11 S&P sectors. In terms of sector uh, returns, you had communication services, consumer staples, industrials uh, all up. And, and again, if you ask me to look at one sector, tell you one sector based on the individual stocks that I've been looking at that, you know, tend to have some of the more attractive charts, uh, it would be, I would probably go with communication services. And it's, uh, it's a lot of different uh, patterns. And, it, and it's if you go outside of the mega cap stocks, it's outside of the things like Alphabet and Netflix and others, you go into things uh, more like the video game names, the media stocks, uh, you know, Disney obviously up pretty significantly today, uh, if you miss that. So stocks like that are, 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 are in beautiful setups. And I think, uh, you know, from my bottom-up perspective, pretty strong, uh, pretty strong sector. What underperformed today was energy, was financials, materials, consumer discretionary. And energy and financials, those are two sectors, especially on the RRG, you can see them moving almost in lockstep in, in some ways, uh, sort of rotating around uh, the benchmark. That's something to pay attention to. Um, going into next week. In terms of individual names, just want to point out, boy, cruise lines, airlines, they tend to be the biggest gainers or the biggest losers. And it's back to the biggest, uh, the biggest drops in their scooter rankings. Now, something like AAL, this individual chart is just fascinating. It's this cluster of big uh, up and down days. You had you know, a down day on Wednesday, an update. It's actually called, you may kind of call that a bullish piercing line, but I don't think I would necessarily be as big a fan of that. You really want to see that more in a downtrend. But uh, you know, finished uh, finished up and then gave it right back uh, today. This is what you call a bearish Harami pattern where the second day's range is engulfed by the first day's range, but it's a down day after an update. That's short-term week going into uh, next week, according to the candle patterns. That, uh, that stock down over 5% today. Plenty of individual stocks to look at. We'll get into some of those on Monday's show, but let's continue on our weekly wrap by focusing on the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is designed to tell us overall long-term structurally what's changing week to week. In terms of what's not changing, it's the overall structural uptrend in U.S. equities. The S&P on our market trend model remains bullish in the long-term, medium-term, short-term. 
uh, measurements. These are all based on weekly exponential moving averages, as we've discussed before. The long-term model bullish since June, medium-term model bullish since early November, and the short-term model bullish since early October, um, uh, late October, excuse me. So overall, all, all three of those um, saying long and strong. And, and that's right, when the, when the market's at or near new highs, making a new intraday uh, high or intra-week high this, uh, this week, uh, uh, certainly would, would expect those to be positive. And that's what we're seeing, you know, looking for downturns in the short term or medium term would be one indication that the uptrend is exhausted and that uh, not just that it's exhausted, but that sellers are actually taking action. Profit taking is occurring. We haven't seen it yet uh, enough to, uh, to trigger that model. The daily chart of the S&P, I, I bring this up just to show, you know, Wednesday we had this bearish engulfing pattern. This is why engulfing patterns uh, are, are something I, I don't, talk about a lot of candle patterns because in general, it tends to be a shorter term methodology. If I was a swing trader, I would be spending a lot more time thinking about them and, and trading them. And there's a whole discipline of looking at the levels and the highs and lows of the patterns. And if that's some that's your time frame, I'd encourage you to uh, dig into Steve Nissen and others who have uh, who have done a great job sort of uh, articulating how to use some of those different candle patterns. But this bearish engulfing pattern is something I do use because it, it tends to have a broader impact. You know, seeing that suggest a transition from short-term bearishness to short-term or short-term bullishness to a short-term bearish read. And, and usually it tells you about the next day or two uh, being weaker rather than stronger. And that's what we've seen. We've seen the S&P pull back a little bit. This doesn't count nearly enough to call this a broad pullback or a pullback enough to, you know, register, uh, you know, on, on the daily chart. Daily chart still appears to be in a pretty good uptrend. You know, as we would continue down into next week, if that's what happens, 3550 to 3600, this green shaded area was absolutely the first line in the sand I would be eyeing. As long as we remain above 3550, that's a pretty, uh, you know, pretty strong uh, uptrend still in place. Uh, a break below there, a break below the 50 day would cause me to rethink that, and maybe look at some of these lower pullback levels. But overall, until proven otherwise, trend is positive. And I think one of the ways you can see that is with the breadth picture. If you look at large cap, mid cap, small cap, the broad NYSE, all of those cumulative advanced decline lines going to new highs, uh, higher highs, higher lows, that's an uptrend. And it tells you that, you know, essentially there's broad participation. This is not a small, you know, um, uh, a uh, limited number of stocks that are pushing to new highs. It's a broad advance driven by uh, a number of charts. A lot of charts uh, look, look fairly constructive here. In terms of new highs and new lows, uh, you know, non-existent new lows, because very few stocks are anywhere near their 52-week low. That makes sense. Um, but, uh, you know, the question is, do we see a continued amount of 52-week new highs? You saw a little, uh, you know, a uh, very few number yesterday after the pullback off of the, uh, the intraday high on Wednesday. Uh, this is not updated yet for today. I would assume you'd see a similar uh, sort of reading to that. So, you know, going into next week and beyond, you want to continue to see a healthy number of stocks making new highs. That tells you even if the s and is not able to power through 3,700 and go beyond, uh, individual stocks, certain groups, certain themes are still working. Um, so that's one thing I would certainly want to see if I'm bullish and expecting upside going into the beginning of the, of, uh, of the next year. In terms of breadth here, we're looking at the percent of stocks above the 200-day moving average. We're just above 90% as of Thursday's close. We peaked out around 92%. You can see from this blue horizontal line, we haven't seen that in over five years. You have to go back to uh, you know things like 2009, uh, a couple times after that, maybe 2013. I think you saw a similar reading. Uh, and while you're right, both of those, uh, the market ended up higher a year later. Um, most of the times when that's happened, you've had at least a bit of a pullback because so many stocks above their 200 day means sort of everything's working. And when everything's working, certain things start to not work just a little bit and the market corrects a little bit. So that's one of these sort of tap the brakes type of, uh, of things that I'm seeing. Sentiment has been fairly elevated. I, you know, I, I've asked Mark Young about this, uh, who's one of our sentiment uh, experts. He was on the show yesterday. Did a great job talking about some news, um, uh, some other sentiment surveys that we don't uh, refer to very often on the show. But I did ask him about the AAII survey before the show. We didn't get to it, I think, during the uh, the main interview. But you know, his, his comment was, you know, you have to remember that, uh, you know, is it elevated? Absolutely. Um, you know, for him the extremes on the upside are less meaningful than the extremes on the downside was how he described it. So he said the fact that, you know, so many people are bullish are less of a concern. It's less of a timing tool. Um, you know, that didn't help me feel any better about the fact that almost 50% of respondents are bullish. And when I look back, I'm finding a lot of times where that's more, that's closer to the end of the 
uh, uptrend as opposed to the beginning of the uptrend. But uh, for what it's worth, that was that was his take on it. So, you know, uh, what concerns me more than that are things like the put call ratio at, at all time lows I and mean, literally all time lows. Ride X flows at all time uh, lows as well, both sort of contrarian uh, bearish signals. In terms of ratios, I'll just hop around very quickly here. Semiconductors continue to do very well on a relative basis, pull back a little bit going into the end of the week, but you can see the long-term trend certainly remains very, very positive. That's been a good group in an up tape and also in a down tape and, tape, and I think that's a, an important one to continue to watch. Small caps continue to outperform. Look at the relative performance of small caps since uh, late September. It's been just accelerating to the upside, which was pretty impressive. Um, the last thing I just wanted to highlight, we talked about the weaker dollar and some of the concerns there. If you've not looked at this chart in, the while, in a while, this is the ratio of the SPY versus equity, which is all country world index, which means it's sort of like the US versus the entire global equity uh, markets. You can see that this has been favoring uh, non-US stocks since mid-October. So if you've not been planning on a weaker dollar, if you've not been looking at your non-US allocation, I think this chart hopefully would encourage you to revisit that and look for some opportunities outside the US. At the very least, uh, you know, some sort of exposure there could certainly be helpful if this line continues lower, we get a weaker dollar going into next year. That is our weekly wrap. A lot of themes to touch on. And overall, again, a market that has been healthy. And it's all about identifying when a trend is exhausted. Let's take a break. We'll be back with the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, here at StockCharts.com. Really appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close, especially on a Friday. It's one of my favorite shows. Really, for me, my weekly routine starts on Thursday as I go through some charts, prepare for a note to clients on uh, on Friday morning. And then this show is a really good way of just sort of ushering in the weekend. It's, you know, it's tough to take a step back when the markets are open and active. It is a perfect time to do it. Uh, on the on the weekends uh, on a Friday evening, I usually do uh, some on a Friday evening. I'll try to do some on a Sunday, and then Monday morning is when I dig into the rest of it. And and that routine, sticking to that same thing every week, has served me very very well. I hope you're able to build your own routines based on some of the things we talk about on the show. As a reminder, we're going to open the mailbag here in a moment. These are all questions from you in the last day or two. As a reminder, we love hearing from you, especially questions that come up. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Let us know what you're running into, and we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. Question number one in the final bar mailbag. A great show. I'm skipping a bit here. How do you assign ratings to individual stocks in a portfolio that is well diversified? Also, I noticed volume is not used in your charts and wanted to know the reason. Have a great week. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. So hitting on your last point, you know, I, why is volume not on my charts? I don't talk about volume a ton. And, you know, for me, I first learned about volume when I first learned about charting. My introduction to technical analysis was the John Murphy book that I read when I was at Bloomberg, or, you know, maybe 2000, 2001. And... You know, I remember reading about volume and I incorporated it and I looked a lot at volume. Uh, at the time, uh, Laszlo Barini's money flow was uh, still very popular. It became, you know, very effective in the 80s and 90s, uh, but uh, started to become less effective, I, I think, in the 2000s, given decimalization and some other things. It was all based on tick data. Um, and, uh, and you could look at block versus non-block trades. And, you know, so there, there are plenty of things I used to look at in terms of volume. Uh, and I think one thing that has changed over the course of my career is relying less and less on volume. And I think for me, seeing the transition from, you know, at the time when I started, I was taught, look at the pit volume because the electronic volume was kind of just this other thing that you didn't even need to worry about. So I remember specifically limiting, I would only look at prices from the pit and I would only look at, you know, volume from the pit. And of course, that's totally different. I mean, that, that's sort of uh, that's sort of broken. So there was a, a concept of looking at volume reads because you could assume 
when a stock moves on heavy volume, it was a directional bet made by a big institution. I don't think you can make that assumption anymore um, just because of the way that uh, exchanges operate, the way that prints are, are done, that you know, dark pools weren't really a thing. And now that, you know, the, the composite tape and what that means is something very different. So for me personally, I've used volume less and less. There are certain places where I think volume is very, very helpful. Uh, Mark Chaikin, uh, whose work we, we feature in different places, the Chaikin Money Flow, which has a volume component. Uh, if there was one thing I would do, I would be looking at that or like the on balance volume I will refer to as well. But in terms of regular volume prints, I use it very rarely. Some of my fellow stock charts contributors have it much more uh, prominent in their process and I wish them the best with that. That is great. Uh, and that is theirs. Uh, but yeah, not my own. I, I really don't. I don't really know how to answer your first question, how, how you assign ratings to individual stocks in a portfolio, but I would say when I think of relative strength at the portfolio level, the scooter rankings, the stock charts technical ranking is one really helpful way of doing that and looking at what sectors and industries you're allocated to and what their uh, trend ratings are, I think is really helpful. Looking for stocks within or, or holdings ETFs within your portfolio that start to have a big change in the scooter ranking uh, to the downside, I think is really helpful as an alert as well. Next question, longtime fan of the final bar. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, let, we'll get to some. Uh, I noticed MACD death crosses on the daily charts this afternoon for the major indices, Dow Jones and SPY. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, let's take a look. I'm actually, I uh, did not notice that. So let's check it out. Here we go. SPX. I'm going to go to the bottom and uh, switch this guy to the MACD. So I, you know, I don't use MACD a ton. I use the PPO instead. Um, they're, they're very homogenous. I mean, they're, they're very similar. And so I, I don't mind using either of those. PPO I had not used until I really started to use stock charts. It's MACD, but it's based on percents instead of dollars. And I found in terms of comparing stocks or ETFs on an apples to apples basis, it makes it a lot uh, more easy, more, more uh, uh, fluid to do that. So, but, but MACD, the signals are going to be almost identical and, and I think you're fine. So this is what I would assume you're referring to. And I think you're right. If you look at this sort of short term swing pattern, which is what the daily MACD is, is designed to tell you, it's basically telling you, you know, sell here, buy here. And I'm looking at the signals down at the bottom and where we're at in the price sell here, buy here. So you can see it's not designed to tell you the actual peak or valley. It tells you after it's turned a little bit because it's a trend following tool and that's by design. It gives you a buy signal here. Just giving a sell signal, I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, what it's telling you is, it, you know, using the MACD on the short term, it's telling you uh, a bit of short term weakness. That, that honestly, I think the concern is how do you balance that with the seasonal tendencies, which would suggest strength going into year end. Um, and I, I don't know how to answer that, except I'm going to follow the trend. So if this is an indication of short-term trend, absolutely right. Giving a sell signal could indicate some further weakness into, uh, into, uh, into next week. Uh, you know, the things that I'm looking at, you, we've hopefully heard with the S&P, if you take a trend line from the, uh, the late October low, we've already broken it. Actually, we broke here in, uh, in uh, early December and, and broken that trend line to the downside. But a lot of stocks have a really clear trend line taking the recent lows and seeing some individual names break down through those trend lines would concern me or the S&P breaking down through something like 3,600, the previous swing lows, that would convince me a little more. Next question. Uh, let, this was a meaty question. So I'm going to summarize as much as possible. Relative price performance versus another equity. Um, what's considered to be leading in price performance. See um, these two stocks. Can you remember, let's recommend a simple way how I can scan based on relative price performance in the stock chart scan tool. Yeah, that's what you're kind of getting at is looking at movements in that line. So there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the good news is uh, you can scan on it. Um, the bad news is it's not complete. It's not done. And, and, you know, talking with our founder, Chip Anderson, this is one thing we've talked about for, uh, for 2021. Um, is uh, is thinking a little bit more about the scan engine and uh, and and some things we could we could do a little better. Um, I'll show you a scan that I use to actually search for relative strength. And Bill Shelby, who's sort of our scan engine expert, he 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 uses this better than anyone. Maybe you know he and Chip are the two that I would I would ask questions of. This is why I talked with uh, with Bill Shelby about this, and and this is what we came up with. We do have a an argument called percent relative PCT relative. And has these two arguments, what day count or what bar count and um, the uh, benchmark that you're going to use. So I said 10 comma dollar sign SPX basically said uh, it's basically the value of the last 10 day return of this stock versus the S&P, right? The difference between those two returns. So what I did was two things. I said over the last 20 days, which would be the last month, I want uh, something that's outperformed the S&P. Here, uh, I'm saying for the last 10 days, uh, the, the, the 10 day 
uh, return is better than yesterday. So it's increasing day to day. That's not ideal. And so what you really want to, what I would really want, want to do, which, you know, we're, we're talking about doing is basically saying, um, you know, if you have this chart, I want to know where this line is going higher, which is the relative performance of IBM versus a benchmark. We can't do exactly that, but we can do something really, really close. And that's what I would use. And if you mess with the time periods, if you mess with the different, uh, you know, things you would want to uh, you know, the different arguments here, you can you can come up with it. Running the scan, you'll find a bunch of things where the relative line is, is making a new swing high. And, that, and that's why I find it's pretty helpful. So maybe start with that and uh, and uh, and go from there. If you miss or you don't know what I just did here, shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I'm happy to send you this, uh, this in text format. You just copy and paste it right into the scan engine. You can start from there and start to tinker around with it. The last question, I'm seeing differences, and I'm summarizing this one, there's a pretty meaty question, but I'm seeing difference between perf charts, the performance charts, and the um, the relative performance on your charts. Uh, and so you're referring to this. So there's a theme here on this ratio line. And so, yeah, so seeing a difference, right? So this is showing for the last year, IBM versus the S&P down 17.7%. And you're saying you're running the same sort of thing in the performance charts, and you're getting a different number. And that's actually not surprising to me. Um, so this, I'll try to summarize this in a minute. I apologize if it's not uh, super clear, but, but basically here's the story. What you're doing here literally is you're saying, I want a ratio of IBM versus the S&P 500. And this is plotting that ratio over time. So at the end of this, when this says minus 17.66%, that's saying the ratio has actually gone down by that amount over time. That does not mean that if you bought IBM and uh, that you would have underperformed the S&P by 17.7% over that period. Because what that is doing is actually looking at the return from point to point on IBM and the return on the S&P and subtracting one versus the other. The, the numbers are gonna be similar and the direction of those two lines would be similar, but the way you're representing this visually when you do price performance, it's not exact. So it, you're gonna get different, uh, different levels for it. So if you hear the language, I tend to say it's underperformed by about 18% or 17%. And I do that because it's depending on the prices you're using and depending on the time frames, they can become very disconnected. So you have to know that this line is simply a ratio and you're looking at the change in that ratio. It's not going to completely mirror your performance. So the perf charts actually do give you the difference in return from a starting point. If you bought at point A and sold it today, that is a more accurate representation numerically. I hope that was clear. If not, I'll try to answer it again another time. We need to wrap the show though. We are long on time. Three charts, three minutes. We'll make it tight. Here we go. Some sector group themes I wanted to tease out, sort of the haves and the have-nots. Chart number one is computer hardware. We have a series of uh, industry indexes. I'm using some of the uh, the uh, NYSE ARCA ones. So dollar sign HWI is the computer hardware index. This was extremely overbought here uh, about a week ago. You can see the relative performance has been fantastic. It's at or near new highs, continue to push higher. So I think it is worth remembering that there are pockets of this market, even though you know, you may be wondering with the FANG stocks, what they're doing. You're looking at individual sectors. Remember, there are groups that are making new highs consistently. I would be looking there for sure. Chart number two is financials. Pull back a little bit over the last week after making a new swing high, topping out at two, uh, 29 for the XLF here uh, uh, end of last week. I, I think if we pull back, that's totally reasonable. I would always be looking to the left and see what key level. So in terms of swings, the first short-term line in the sand, I would think would be the peak from mid-November, the low from late November, that's right there. The next line down would be 2650. That's the June peak and the November pullback level. I'd be interested to see if we can hold that. Chart number three is the OSX, dollar sign OSX. That's the oil services index here. We're actually testing the June high right now. We have a bearish divergence. I'm a little concerned about the, uh, the upside for energy stocks, particularly oil services going into year end and into, uh, into January, given that bearish divergence as it approaches uh, those long-term highs. Folks, that is our show. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you Monday uh, after you refresh, renew, and all of that. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. See you on Monday. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.